Good morning. Good morning. It is time to come together to honor and glorify our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for being with us this morning. For you joining in the room with us. For you joining with us online. Thank you for being here. And uh, we'll come together today to, to praise and lift up the name of Jesus. Psalm 34 begins, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. And the humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. That's what we're here for. Exalt the name of the Lord. And uh, so thank you for being here. Before we do that, or as we do that, we need to begin with prayer. And uh, the, the first, the very first, most important part of my prayer needs to be worship. It needs to be praise. It needs to be to exalt the name of Jesus. Um, and uh, so we'll do that this morning. But also, uh, of course, we've, we've got a lot of things to pray about. Uh, we pray for our nation to continue through this, through our election time. There's just a lot of needs to pray for in our nation with the COVID situation and, and just a lot of things that we need to pray for for our nation, folks that are serving in, in so many different ways in our, in our country. Uh, just bathe that in prayer. Uh, so folks pray for in our, within our congregation. Uh, uh, surely, surely mention, uh, be sure and keep the family of Sheila Hart in in her thoughts and her, in her prayers. She, uh, she passed away uh, this week, uh, Leon McCleary's daughter. Um, keep, keep Ellen's family in your, in your thoughts and in your prayers. Her, her sister would pray for her for a long time. She's been in the nursing home and, and uh, had some health comp uh, some health issues complicated by the coronavirus. Uh, so uh, March 3rd, Linda Thurman passed away this past week. So be sure to remember Ellen and her family. Uh, lift them up. And uh, a lot of needs to pray for. If you would, pray for my daughter. Get folks to have next week. She's going to have a baby. Um, I'm not. She, she's going to have a baby. But be sure and pray for, for, for Sean and Christy this week. She is this morning going over for her COVID test, and that's really important uh, that that goes well. So be sure and pray about that. And uh, she will go to the hospital. I've never heard of this. She will go to the hospital at midnight on Tuesday. And uh, anyway, they'll get, they will get her started, and they're going to induce her labor. If it doesn't start before then, they'll induce her labor. Uh, and then they said they'd take six hours to three days after that. But anyway, so we'll see what happens. But if you, if you would, with, with all the health stuff, uh, having a baby is a big thing anyway. But, it, so, but with the health complications, make sure to pray for Christy if you would. Uh, a, lot of different, a lot of different needs, a lot of different folks to pray for. Um, and uh, so, so be, be, be pray for folks. We, last week we, we mentioned, uh, uh, we, we shared about our, our, our veterans. And acknowledge our veterans, folks that serve in the military. Uh, be sure to pray for the folks that are serving in the military. Devin is, is continuing with this with his combat training, and we're really proud of him. Keep praying for him, and uh, also uh, uh, pray for pray for with, with for, for for a long time. And that's Guy and Star Hawkins on our on our prayer list. Uh, Star busted her leg really bad uh, last week. She broke five bones in her leg and tore six tendons loose. And so anyway, she's got a long recovery ahead of herself. So. Be sure and pray for Star. Um, a lot of a lot of needs that we need to pray for this morning. Um, but uh, first thing, let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's honor and praise Him and pray for His presence in this room and that His name will be honored and glorified. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the the honor of being able to gather in your house today. Father, we thank you that you are God and that you are Lord. And Father, as we look around our nation, as we look around. Uh, even even locally, as we look around, Father, there's a there's, there's a lot of what, what to us looks like chaos. What looks like to us there's, there's a lot of difficult things going on around us, both in our nation and Father, even even right here at home. There's a lot of there's a lot of, 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 of difficult things going on around us, and Father, sometimes it seems like that's all that that's all out of control, or that is some kind of chaos. But Father, you are a God of order. You're a God of of power and strength, and we thank you that the, the, the things that are going on around us, that they don't catch you off guard. Father, that you are a God, that you are uh, all-powerful and all-knowing. We thank you for that. We pray for your moving, not only across our nation, but in our community and in our church. We pray as we gather today that your name will be exalted. Father, that, that we'll be able to come into this time of worship and just uh, to bow before you. Father, that not only to be able to lay before you the things that are on our hearts and on our minds this morning, but Father, also if, uh, in, in all that we need to, to be able to set those aside and to concentrate and focus on you 
in, in, your, in the peace that you bring. We pray for the needs that, that were mentioned this morning. Father, there's so many others that we don't mention out loud for Peter. Because uh, we don't know how, or sometimes our, our memories are feeble. We, we pray for um, each one, and we pray that you'll help us as we come to be here this day, that we'll withdraw from you for strength. We honor you, and we praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Good morning. Morning. You said six hours to three days. Six hours to three days. That's quite a window. <laughs> okay, our first one is going to be number 563. Count your blessings. <laughs>
everybody. Hebrews 9, 22 through 28. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus it was necessary for the sketches of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves need better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one. But he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself again and again as a high priest enters the holy place year after year with blood that is not his own. For then he would have to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it appointed for mortals to die once and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting on him. Shedding of blood just means it means loss of life, the giving of a life. That's exactly what it means. And um, sins are so unacceptable to a holy God that in his wisdom, he made this so, the shedding of blood. And we as humans have a tendency to water down sin. I, I, I just, I think I, I do. Well, it ain't that bad. You know, I'm not that bad, at least not as bad as old so-and-so, you know, but this flawed thinking leads to self-righteousness. Uh, the big test is how you compare yourself to Jesus Christ, and we're all going to fall down on that one. Um, there's scriptures that say over and over, says that uh, say to Im imitate Christ, no bother me. I don't do a very good job of imitating Christ. Even the Apostle Paul says he kind of felt like a failure in those things, but do your best to imitate Christ. You know, he says, I do things I don't want to do, and this and that, but that's tough. That's tough. I know I fail miserably, and I get aggravated thinking, I let you down, Jesus. You know, I can read it myself. After a bad day, sometimes I think, Jesus, why would you give your life for me and the rest of this fallen sinful world why are we worth it you know the sinner ought to pay not you me I ought to pay not you but God makes the rules he makes the rules and praise him for that the perfect given for the sinners Jesus went to the cross to die a horrible, wretched, cruel death. I can't imagine in our place for each and every one of us and people of all time. I'm asking, I guess, is, let's think about him on the cross. Really draw that mental picture of him on the cross. And it's tough. It is tough. Oh, thinking this is just not right. Why would he do this when it should have been me? But he suffered beyond our comprehension. He really did. All for the shedding of blood for our forgiveness. Okay. Let's thank him. Let's praise him. Let's honor him. Let's give ourselves totally to him, wholly to him. I know it's not easy, but not just there at the end time we'll walk out the doors. You know. Let's never take this communion time casually or lightly or routinely. Okay. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your written word. Father, it convicts us. It really does. It convicts us, Father, what you're supposed to do. Father God, we want to thank you for sending Jesus to the cross. We want to thank Jesus for going willingly, Father, to take our place on the cross, Father. He shed his blood in our place, Father, so we'd be forgiven. Someday, Father, see heaven where he's sitting right now beside the Father. Father God, help take these endless, Father, and draw that picture of the cross for our loving Savior, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Our communion hymn will be number 519, Something Beautiful, and we'll go ahead and sing it through. <laughs>
for that. <laughs> now I am totally out of whack. I don't know. If... Can you hear me all right? Okay. Well, let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Father God, we come to you today so grateful for your love. Lord, we come today to worship you, to honor you above all. Lord, may this day be a blessing to you. May it be a day that we receive your word, take it home with us, and spread it out into the world. Lord, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, one of my favorite things to do with my wife when we're on our leisure time is to go to a concert. We've been to lots and lots of concerts. We've been to some really good concerts. Some of the best have been the Christian concerts that we've attended. Sometimes, though, they're not always great. Sometimes maybe the singer's a little off-key, or maybe some of the instrumentalists have, have missed a riff or missed something in their playing, or they're just not as into it as they should be. Such was not the case when the professional violinist gave his concert. He played an immaculate concert. When he finished, the audience stood up, they cheered, they applauded. But as he went off the stage, there were tears streaming down his face. A stagehand noticed and said, what's wrong? Don't you see all those people standing up and applauding? You just gave a magnificent concert. The violinist said, you don't understand. You see that guy in the center, in the front row, that's still sitting? The stagehand said, so what? 2,000 other people are standing up applauding, cheering you. That one sitting in the middle is my father. And he's my violin instructor. <coughs> if he doesn't stand and applaud, it doesn't matter what the other 2,000 do. It's the same way with God. If God looks at your life and the way you've lived your life, and he's not applauding the way you're living your life, it doesn't matter what everyone else, the world, thinks. He is the one that counts. I don't know about you, but when I get up and I stand in front of God, before he hands me that key to my mansion, I want him to look at me and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Today we're gonna to continue in our series, I Will. As you've probably guessed today, it is I will serve. We're going to wrap up the series at the end of this with a little bit about I will also make a difference. Now, as the world looks at the Bible, many of them say it's not pertinent to today's world, to today's society. It's outdated. It's outmoded. We have grown past the Bible and the wisdom of Solomon. I don't think so. I don't think anyone here will argue that yes, indeed, technology has advanced immensely since the days of Solomon and Paul and Peter and all the writers of the Bible. In those days, transportation was basically walking, maybe riding a horse or, or getting on a boat to sail somewhere. Today, we can get on a plane and be anywhere in the world in a matter of hours. When Paul would write a letter, he would write a letter to one of the congregations, and it would take weeks, maybe even months, to get to those congregations. Now, we send a letter with a push of a button almost instantaneously. It can be anywhere in the world, thanks to cell phones and computers and satellites. So yes, technology has changed. Man, however, has not. We are still 
the same as we have always been. Yes, mankind knows a lot more than our forefathers knew, but we are not any smarter or wiser for it. Proof of that is in the fact that we are still making the same mistakes. It is said that history will repeat itself. Well, one of the biggest reasons that history repeats itself is because we don't study and take note of what history has done and do things to avert history repeating itself. Today's text is going to come from the book of Matthew, chapter 20. So if you've got your Bibles with you or your phone, you can turn to Matthew, chapter 20. Now, this scripture is going to remind us that then, just as now, man can be taught, but it doesn't necessarily sink in. Like the proverbial horse, it can be led to water, but it doesn't mean it's going to drink. Sometimes things just don't sink in, even if we've been told again and again and again. Matthew 20, starting in verse 20, going through verse 28. Then the mother of Zebedee's son came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left, in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, we are able. So he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptized, baptism that I will be baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and my left hand is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In verses 20 and 21, the mother of Zebedee, his sons, goes to Jesus and makes a request. Now, Zebedee's sons are James and John, the apostles. They are also given a nickname by Jesus, the nickname of Bonardes, which translated means the sons of thunder. Apparently, their mother had a little thunder as well. At the very least, she is bold by going to Jesus to make such a request of him for her sons. There is, however, a good chance, based on the accounts of the crucifixion, that the mother of James and John is also the aunt to Jesus. Her name is Salome. Unless there were more women that didn't get named in the crucifixion scene, she is the sister of Mary, which makes her Jesus' aunt, which also makes James and John first cousins to Jesus. Now, it's not really important to know whether or not they are first cousins, and she is indeed their aunt. What's important is that she would go to Jesus and make a huge request on their behalf. Salome was looking to gain a level of prominence for her sons, and probably for herself as well. What mother does not want her children to rise to an important position, to a position of success? Parents take a great deal of pride in their children, don't they? I'm sure we've all heard a mother or father introduce their son as my son, the lawyer, or my daughter, the doctor, or author, or teacher, or any other name or title that has some level of prominence to go along with it. Parents are proud of their children. 
When Jesus replies, though, he doesn't reply to Salome. He replies directly to James and John. Now, we don't know if James and John really had anything to do with this request. I suspect so because they're standing right there when she makes the request. However, they, like many of us, are guilty of having at least some level of ambition. They want to be important. But Jesus tells them point blank in verse 22, you do not know what you are asking for. Jesus is about to pay a high price for us. A price that he knows is going to be paid by almost all of the apostles at some time. The price of martyrdom. A price that was told them just three verses earlier. Starting in verse 17, chapter 20. Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priest and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Deliver him to the Gentiles to mock, to scourge, and to crucify. And then on the third day, he will rise again. James and John say, yes, we are able to drink of that same cup, but I wonder if they really thought that through. And the reason I say that, they don't seem to get it a lot of the time. None of the disciples do. Remember when Jesus returns, how surprised they were? It was only then that they remembered, oh yeah, he said something about this. So I wonder if they were thinking, you know, just a few verses ago, just a few minutes ago, Jesus said he's going to go die, be scourged. Did that really sink into them at that moment? I don't know. Now, each of the apostles would indeed drink from that cup, <coughs> except for two. The apostle John was the only one that would live to be a ripe old age. Then Judas would kill himself. James would be the first to drink of that cup when Herod kills him with a sword because it pleased the Jews. Verse 24, we see that those other two or 10 are not very pleased with this request that are made by the mothers of James and John. Your mommy goes and makes a request of Jesus that you be sent to the places of prominence? Come on! What's the deal? All of them are still thinking along earthly values, not heavenly values. Jesus reminds them of that, and that it is a wrong way of thinking in verses 25 through 27 when he tells them, but Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be the first among you, let him be <coughs> your slave. Basically, Jesus is telling them, you can see how the world operates. You can see that the rulers lord it over their people. You are supposed to be different. If you want to be great, you need to start as a servant. If you want to be that top dog, you need to start as a slave at the bottom. The one who is truly great in the kingdom of God is someone that is a slave to the kingdom, sold out completely to Christ and to his kingdom. Paul frequently referred to himself in that way. He referred to himself as a bondservant, a slave of Christ. He considered himself, as we should, as being owned by Christ because Christ paid the price for us. He paid with his precious blood, a price that we could never pay. Jesus finishes this idea in verse 28, when he says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as ransom 
for men. Jesus came to earth to serve, to save. Jesus has the power to make man serve him if he so desired. But that's not what he wanted. We were given free will. God wants us to serve him because we want to serve him. Not because of who he is. There was once a TV series. It's been quite a while now. And when my kids were about that tall when it was on. It was called the dinosaurs or something close to that. I don't remember exactly. These dinosaurs had the traits of humans. They dressed in clothes. They, the dad went to work. The mother kept house and cooked. And they had a teenage son, a younger daughter, and a baby. Whenever that baby got into mischief, whenever it got into trouble, and it looked like it was going to be punished, he gave a line that became famous and so well liked that there were bumper stickers and t-shirts and it was everywhere you went. The baby would say, gotta love me, I'm the baby. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. God doesn't want that from us. He doesn't want us to love him just because he is God. He wants us to use our free will and with that free will, he wants us to serve him to love him. God is not going to come down here and say, you got to love me because I'm God. It is through our free will and our desire to serve him that he wants us to serve and love him. He made the choice to send his son to us in order to serve as a sacrifice for us. He sent his son to us as an example for us. Jesus came to serve so that we can learn from him, learn what it means to serve one another. Church, I know that the world says put yourself first. It tells us watch out for numero uno. That's what's important to the world. That's not the way, not the example that Jesus gives us though. We need to stop worrying about what the world thinks, what the world would want us to do, and instead ask, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus want us to do? How do I imitate Jesus? We imitate Jesus by serving one another, and thus serving God in Jesus. We need to serve others. We need to serve in the church. We need to serve in the community. We need to serve at home. Look for ways to serve and make a difference. One person is all it takes to make a difference. 